Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. It's 11 o'clock. And uh, I am Lars Burman, uh, Uppsala University Library, who will be standing in as chair for this session. I welcome you all to this last main block of the conference. Uh, I have been asked to tell you that uh, about the tours of the old library. Delegates who did not get a chance to take a tour of the old library last night can do so today. Just show your delegate badge at the entrance. And uh, I also want to tell you that the afternoon tours to local libraries uh, and heritage libraries, they will depart from the Campanile, the bell tower in the front square at 1.45 p.m. And now it is my great honor and privilege to introduce to you Richard Ovenden, Bodley's librarian. Richard is well known to most of us. He has done a most distinguished library career spanning Durham University Library, uh, the House of Lords Library, the National Library of Scotland, the University of Edinburgh. And since 2014, he has been head of the Bodleian Libraries, University of Oxford. The talk we will hear today will deal with threats to knowledge, a crucial issue in a good and open society and a most central question for libraries. In a recent article in The Economist, Richard writes about us librarians and archivists as custodians of the past, but also the advance guards of the future. I think that that is a beautiful and flattering expression, but much more important, it is also a very challenging one. Richard Ovenden's keynote lecture is titled Bits and Votes the role of libraries and archives in open societies. Please, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Lars, for that very generous uh, introduction, and in particular to the LIBA uh, conference committee here, um, uh, for giving me this invitation to come and speak to you today. It's always an immense pleasure to be in Dublin. I'm never happier than when I'm uh, here. And um, I, it's very wonderful to see so many friends and to be among you all um, today. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, the truth is under attack. This is not something new, of course, but attacks on truth are once more becoming the go-to tool for populist politicians who see opportunities to subvert democratic, democratic institutions all around the world. As George Orwell pointed out in his novel 1984, which increasingly reads as a handbook for our contemporary age rather than as a dystopian vision of the future, there was truth there was untruth, and if you cling, clung to the truth, even against the whole world, you were not mad. Libraries and archives are institutions that help us cling to the truth, and the role that they play and the services they provide are in the front line of the defense of open societies. The notion that there could exist alternative facts was first asserted by President Donald Trump's press secretary, Kellyanne Conway, uh, in January 2017, following her boss's assertion that the crowd that attended his inauguration ceremony was larger than that which had attended the same event when Barack Obama had been inaugurated president. It provided the world with an early warning sign uh, that preservation of information was going to be important. Defending the truth against the rise of alternative facts means capturing and preserving those truths, as well as the statements that deny them, 
so that we have a trusted reference point which citizens can rely on. The preserved data showed that Trump was wrong. My presentation today is a call for libraries and archives to regroup around a core, one of our core missions, preservation. For much of my time in the profession, our focus has moved away from preservation and towards access and the provision of services. This has been a right and important move for us to undertake. And we have, to quote Lorcan Dempsey, taken the service turn. But preservation is deep in the DNA of libraries and archives. And my thesis today is that preservation is once more becoming key to, our, to the advocacy that we must play for societies. We must rethink the position that preservation takes in our strategies and our advocacy to governments and the way we allocate funding and develop the sense of preservation as a service to society. The centrality of preservation was vividly brought home to me last April uh, amidst, in the midst of the public debate about the UK government's immigration policy especially that directed toward the Windrush generation of Commonwealth citizens who had accepted an invitation to come and work in post-war Britain. Since 2010, government policy has sought to challenge those individuals' rights to citizenship by forcing them to prove their continued residence in the UK and the legality of their right to remain. Last April, it became clear that the Home Office had, in 2010, deliberately destroyed a vast array of public records that they held, the landing cards of those citizens who had worked hard, paid taxes, and been model citizens during the period that Theresa May had been Home Secretary. I wrote an op-ed for the Financial Times, highlighting the fact that the same government department that was placing enormous strain on these individuals was at the same time destroying the evidence that many of them could have used to defend themselves. Archives were at the heart of the rights of citizens and at the heart of contentious political debate. That, that particularly lamentable episode led me to look back at the history of the deliberate destruction of libraries and archives. Of course, there's one very famous episode of that here in Dublin, but I'm not going to Britsplain that to you. <laughs> here are some other examples which highlight the centrality of what libraries and archives do, and the first is another example of the British Empire's less than finest hour. In 1812, Britain was at war with the newly independent America, when a force under the direction of Admiral Coburn invaded that, the continent, and by 1814 was on the outskirts of Washington, which in 1800 had been designated the nation's capital. The move of Congress meant that the library that had been built up since the first session of Congress, and by 1812 was over 6,000 volumes, was established in Washington. In fact, Washington was such a small town at this point that it was the only library. The newly built Congress building, the only stone built edifice in the city, contained a number of rooms, according to George Gleig, a Scotsman in the British Army who witnessed the fall of Washington. There were rooms, he said, that were furnished as a public library, the two larger being well stocked with valuable books, principally in modern languages, and the others filled with archives, national statutes, acts of legislature, etc., and used as the private rooms of the librarians. Congress needed information to if operate effectively. James Madison had campaigned for funds to be set aside for the Congressional Library early in America's history, arguing that without further provision of books on law and government, to which reference is often necessary, members of the legislature and other offices of government may be deprived of the use of such books when necessary. They needed legal texts to help them formulate their own laws, copies of treaties to formulate their diplomatic arrangements, and they needed information about their own territories so they could manage them effectively. They even began to collect local and regional histories in order to defend themselves against the territorial claims of European powers. George Gleig has left us with a first-hand account of what happened. The British Army besieging Washington was attacked by snipers and in revenge torched the city in an over-the-top response. 
Gleig remembered a few years later that the sky was brilliantly illumined by the different conflagrations, and a dark red light was thrown upon the road, sufficient to permit each man to view distinctly his comrade's face. Except the burning of St. Sebastian's, I do not recollect to have witnessed at any period in my life a scene more striking or more sublime. Even he regretted later that the Congressional Library had been destroyed in this deliberate act of destruction. News of the destruction soon reached uh, Thomas Jefferson, and that's what the Capitol building looked like after, after the fire, which had been kindled by the books and documents in the library. News of the destruction soon reached Thomas Jefferson in his Virginia home at Monticello, Jefferson had the nation's largest private library at the time, larger indeed than many of the institutional libraries. He immediately offered it to Congress um, for a fee to, to replace the one lost by the British, which had perpetrated, in his view, acts of barbarism which do not belong in a civilized age by destroying the, government, the library of the government of a new nation. Jefferson's library did indeed come to Congress, and although much of it was later destroyed in an accidental fire, its presence is still lauded today as an act that widened the intellectual purview of the American government and nation. In addition to statutes of the realm and copies of treaties and trials, Jefferson's library brought philosophical, scientific, and political ideas ac uh, from across the world um, into uh, the heart of the nation's government and its information provision, setting up the library to turn eventually into the great institution it became later in the same century. In 1914, in Louvain or Leuven, the world saw with horror the destruction of the university library there at the hands of the Germans, once again purportedly in retaliation against sniper fire from citizens. The library had become a quasi-national institution by uh, 1914, and the city and its university were in a neutral country when the German army entered the city. The library held important collections and was becoming Belgium's most modern research library, with scholarly journals joining historic collections. The destruction of the library was regarded as an international outrage and sparked a coordinated effort of renewal, which was led by the, pre the president of Columbia University in New York, but in which many other countries around the world participated. And a shout out here to the John Rylands Library, whose director, the wonderfully named Dr. Henry Guppy, organized a massive effort in Britain to support the renewal uh, of the library's collections. Reparations for the loss of the collection, so, so vividly was this act regarded, were actually listed as a separate element of the Treaty of Versailles. And you can see how internationally it became such a kind of touchstone for uh, uh, what had gone on um, by, looking, um, and, uh, by, by looking at the renewal, the uh, extraordinary um, uh, financial and bibliographic effort that happened across the world um, to, to help rebuild the collections and the physical structure of, of the library. And even looking at the, the literature um, published in that period through Google, Google Books Engram Viewer, you can see this kind of spike um, of references uh, to, to Louvain um, in the published literature. The rebuilding of the library became a, di a diplomatic cause célèbre in the 1930s, which is actually worthy of a, a separate conference uh, talk on its own. But that, uh, uh, and that, I hope, uh, at some, some point to be able to, to give. But it was a great shock that the world learned that the library was once again deliberately targeted by Nazi forces in 1940. And the rebuilt library was destroyed again, prompting a repeated building campaign for both building and collection. More recently, I think it's worth remembering the destruction of the National and University Library of Bosnia-Herzegovina in Sarajevo in 1992. The National Library was a repository of the history and culture of a region that had a strong Muslim past following centuries of Ottoman rule. But Bosnia in the 20th century had found a way to allow for a peaceful and constructive coexistence of ethnic groups, Christians, Jews, and Muslims. And the National Library was based on an older building which reflected multiple architectural styles to reflect this multi-ethnic mix in the city. 
On the 25th of August 1992, Serbian forces targeted the library with incendiary shells, destroying a collection of one and a half million volumes. The Times in London reported the destruction on the 27th of August, but the story didn't even reach the front page of the newspaper on the same day. During the trials that followed the conflict in The Hague, testimony was given that made the episode even more shocking. Librarians and firefighters trying to rescue collections were targeted by snipers. The destruction of the National Library was joined by deliberate targeting of other libraries and archives in the region, especially provincial archives which held land registries. The National Library contained a cultural record of a region and its eradication would help the national forgetting of that history. The destruction of the land registries would help eradicate the history of legitimate land ownership by Muslims. There was a truth and there was untruth and if you destroyed libraries and archives the truth would be forgotten. Again, the rebuilding of the library was a symbol of the rebuilding of civil society after the conflict, as well as the memorialization of the human losses during the war. Of all the heroic acts by librarians and archivists during the conflict, one stands out as the protection of the Sarajevo Haggadah, uh, a famous medieval Hebrew manuscript, not from the collections of the National Library, but from those of the National Museum, which was also shelled. It has acquired profound symbolic significance. In 2007, we see archives again at the center of major international and, uh, and national cultural and political events, this time in Iraq. As the American forces entered Baghdad in the early days of the invasion, a discovery was made in the basement of the headquarters of the Ba'ath Party. The party archives were found there, and the American forces soon realized that this collection of millions of documents was a major strategic asset in the, re in the, in the regime change and in the hunt for weapons of mass destruction. They also realized that it needed to be guarded, as there would be attempts from the former members of the Ba'ath Party to destroy the archive in order to hide the documentation of events that could damage the reputation of individuals or lead to prosecution. A group of expatriate Iraqis who had formed a not-for-profit in the US called the Iraq Heritage Foundation were called in to advise, and the archive was removed to Qatar, where it was digitized, a copy being given to the US Army and the CIA for data mining, and another copy to uh, the foundation. In the meantime, other archival collections from unguarded buildings were being plundered and sold to journalists and anyone who would buy or trade them. In 2007, the physical archive and one set of the digital copies which had been given to the foundation was the subject of seeking an institutional home. In that year, the Hoover Institution at Stanford University agreed to hold the archive and its digital surrogate on deposit until such time as it could be returned to Iraq. In the one party state that was Saddamist Iraq, the Ba'ath Party archives are a major source of knowledge of what happened in that country for 40 years. Essentially, they are part of the National Archives. But right now, they're not in Iraq, but in the US, under tightly controlled access arrangements. The archives are well preserved and protected, and one can see the argument for not returning them to Iraq in the years following the fall of Saddam. But that was 16 years ago, and much is now different. The National Archivist has repeatedly called for the records and various other collections also in the US to be returned to Iraq, claiming that they're the property of the Iraqi state. How can Iraq come to terms with what happened to its country without access to its own records generated by its own citizens? In the form of Soviet countries of Central and Eastern Europe, the files of the Stasi have been opened up and a citizen has the right of access to their own file. There are no easy answers here, but it is a salutary reminder that archives and the future of open societies are intimately bound up together. The idea of the social purpose of libraries and archives and the role of preservation in that purpose is one we must return to as a profession and remind our fellow citizens, governments, elected officials and funding bodies of. Libraries and archives are one of the pillars of open societies, alongside the freedom of the press, free and open elections, and independently appointed judiciaries. Aside from the long-held notion that an educated pop population is a social good, going back to John Lux, John Stuart Mill, and others, we need to ensure that electorates have access to information 
as well as governments, as we saw with the Library of Congress in 1814. Citizens, as in Bosnia, have a need to prove their right to own property or even their right to exist as citizens at all. How can citizens know if they're breaking the law if these laws are not disseminated? How can a plural society exist and thrive if bodies of knowledge cannot reflect a diversity of historical truth, human thought, and human experience? Libraries are having a moment. Two books published in 2018 have brought the role of libraries into broader social debates. Susan Orleans' The Library Book focuses on the civic role of the Los Angeles Public Library, and Eric Kleinenberg's Palaces for the People has drawn attention to libraries, especially public libraries, as social infrastructure. These works are a welcome reminder to a wider public that libraries and archives are essential ingredients in making an open society. For the rest of this talk, I would like to focus in a little more detail on the role of digital preservation in this broader sense of how libraries and archives must respond to the current situation. As we all know, digital information is inherently less stable and requires a much more pro proactive approach than analog collections, which exist in Cliff Lynch's famous phrase, in regimes of benign neglect. These challenges have been amplified by the widespread adoption of commercial online services provided by major technology companies, especially those in the world of social media for whom the preservation of knowledge is subordinated to commercial considerations. In recent years, we've experienced a spate of threats to knowledge preservation. At the end of last year, the photo sharing site Flickr, struggling to keep pace with competition from the likes of Instagram, announced that it was reducing the amount of free storage to an arbitrary level of 100 items that its account holders can have access to. Millions of users found that their content was permanently removed and they no longer had access to it. Although Flickr, like many other social media services, claims to be a service for sharing content, many users regarded them primarily as providing free cloud-based storage. What is happening at Flickr shows us that free services aren't really free at all. Their business model is based around the hidden trading of their users', users data, and they, as they lose market share to competitors, their free services have had to make way for premium services. The problem that the Flickr case study throws up is one of digital preservation. We have, as a society, been outsourcing our preservation to these tech companies, but their model is based on storage, and storage is not the same thing as preservation. The truth is under attack, and therefore, so are bytes. Libraries, like the Bodleian in the 17th century, deliberately collected material which was doctrinally different from the Protestant religion that its country had adopted. This information was acquired and preserved to help counter-argument. It was not destroyed. This issue is still valid today. Should we preserve and allow access to content even if we disagree with it? For me, it is the ingredient of an open society that we do this. But libraries and archives are finding increased experience of hacking and cyber warfare with denial of service and other attacks um, taking down access to knowledge. The motivations for these attacks are sometimes hard to divine. Why would the site of a digitized manuscript collections built by the Bodleian and the Vatican Library be targeted multiple times? But it is easier to see why the Internet Archive might be attacked when it hosts content created by groups like ISIS. Access to this information, made possible through digital preservation, is even more crucial when we come to making information about laws available to citizens who are bound by those laws. As Lawrence Lessig's work has shown, we can be neglectful of the dangers of the preservation of web-based information through issues like link rot. In 2014, he showed that 50% of the links on the US Supreme Court website were broken. Another element of an open society at risk Thankfully, the work of the Harvard Law Library and the Supreme Court itself is addressing this key issue, but is one which is pervasive and we have to be very vigilant. As our understanding grows of the way in which data science companies like Cambridge Analytica have been manipulating online information feeds, we need to be doing more to preserve society's online behavior so we can work out what has been going on over the last few years across the world. 
We know that the world of ad tech is constantly profiling our online presence and selling to other tech companies um, those profiles and those data patterns to deliver targeted advertising. But this information is and will be used for less palatable activities than trying to persuade me to buy a BMW, which is what you can see um, going on up here. Student libraries and archives, um, are, stud uh, shouldn't libraries and archives be preserving some of these data? It would be very difficult. It would not be cheap. But I think this, uh, this hidden huge amount of data traded every day is actually one of the major sources for what is going on in our society uh, at the moment. Which brings us back to truth and to Orwell, and to voters and elections. The recent flurry of elections and referenda in the UK have prompted a variety of preservation of activities. At the Bodleian, we've been collecting election ephemera across all ranges of political opinion. But we've also been working with our colleagues in the legal deposit libraries in the UK and with Trinity College Library here in Ireland, who've been working together to implement the 2013 regulations on non-print legal deposit, which allows us in the UK to archive the UK web through the UK web archive. Since the first web archive crawls in 2004, and especially since the first public domain crawl under these legal provisions in 2014, we've been able to plot in detail the extraordinary vulnerability and fragility of the web. One of our special collections has been the 2016 EU referendum, a collection of websites collected more frequently and at deeper levels than the robotic crawl. These sites are maintained as a collection. We had hoped that the legislation that allows us to collect the web in the UK could be adopted in Ireland. And perhaps here in Ireland, you could learn the lessons of the UK and make the access arrangements for the 21st century as opposed to the decidedly 20th century access arrangements, uh, access regime we have for the UK legal deposit web archive. Sound arguments were presented by the wonderful library sector leadership here. And there seemed to be a political consensus to support it coming into law. But this has been thwarted in the last minute just a few weeks ago. Although the Copyright and Other uh, Intellectual Property Law Provisions Act 2019 uh, was just very recently signed into law and is a great step forward, uh, I still urge our colleagues in the National Library of Ireland at Trinity College Library and across the library sector here in Ireland to redouble their efforts. And especially, I appeal to the legislators of this country to return to the issue of um, the lawful archiving of the web, which was missed out of uh, that act um, and is a, a great omission, I feel, in the protection of Ireland as a beacon for open society. It is important. One of the sites which we archive for the UK Legal Deposit Web Archive, leave.eu, recently wiped its website. But fortunately, we captured it, not just, immediate, just immediately prior to its er er erasure, for many weeks prior to that erasure as well. The public statements on that site are available to those who wish to see them by coming into the Legal Deposit Libraries. The issue of preserving political statements is so important at the moment, and particularly in the context of um, populism, the denial of what has been previously said, those public statements being kind of forgotten and erased, that we see some examples, some very powerful examples of what can only be called public activist archiving. This is the activity particularly I'd like to draw your attention to, of a group called Led by Donkeys, <laughs> who've been taking the public utterances of various politicians and placing them in very visible and public points in the UK, across ma in major cities, so that voters can have, have access to those statements, so they can have access to the truth. They are presented with no context, but also without commentary. They have a Twitter feed, and their activities are crowdfunded, and they are subject to electoral regulations. All of these issues are complex, 
technically challenging, and costly. Individual libraries and archives can and are playing their own part. And the sector is collaborating and working together to face these challenges. And I'd particularly like to shout out to the, uh, the organizations like the Digital Preservation Coalition, uh, to which I'm uh, uh, intimately involved, to bodies like Portico, to Clocks, and to other collaborative preservation uh, organizations but also to the role of individual libraries and archives in tackling particularly the, uh, the huge challenges of digital preservation and, and of web archiving in particular. We must all shout louder and louder to raise these problems to governments, to funding bodies, and to voters. I've elsewhere argued for a memory tax uh, on the tech companies that could fund some of this uh, increased activity. And we must look hard inside our own organizations to see if we are playing our part at the right level. There are also signs of increasing um, uh, development of tools that can be used across the community. I've just very recently um, become aware of a Mellon-funded project at the Maryland Institute of Technology and the Humanities called Documenting the Now. I found out about it too recently to actually be able to include it in these slides, but um, please, um, please go and look at the site. It's very interesting work, which I hope that the whole community will benefit from um, in the near future. I'd like to leave you with one final example of the importance of preservation. This is from the Twitter feed of the person who might well become the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Boris Johnson. A few weeks ago, the time, uh, so, oh, sorry, this one. Um, a few weeks ago, at the time of the local government elections, he posted this tweet. It was deleted a few minutes after. As someone pointed out to him, as there were no local government c c elections in his constituency, he could not have cast a vote. <laughs> I think this kind of information is quite important for lect uh, electors to know about. Now that the Library of Congress is no longer working with Twitter, I just hope some library or archive is archiving Boris Johnson's Twitter feed. He just might become one of the most important people on the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, let's keep clinging to the truth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, for this uh, challenging, worrying, and very, very important speech. Uh, with this call to regroup in the name of preservation, you have uh, put an important burden on our librarian shoulders. And I'm glad of that, and I'm ready to carry my part of that burden. We have time for questions. Reflections? Um, thank you, Richard, for that <coughs> excuse me, um, brilliant exposition of standing up for preservation. Um, that was absolutely wonderful. <coughs> excuse me. Just one, um, an example, if I can add a, a local one, um, that is happening as we speak at Dublin Castle. So in, um, we're in a decade of commemorations here in, in, in Ireland, and we're moving towards um, commemorating 1922, which is very sensitive and very difficult. Um, but in uh, 1922, one of the things that happened was that the archives were blown up and destroyed. And so a flagship project for the commemoration in 2022 is a project called Beyond 2022, which will be a virtual recreation of the destroyed archives. And as we speak in Dublin Castle, there's the, the National Archives of the UK, the National Archives of Ireland, and the Public Record Office of Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland, with computer scientists who have created a virtual building. And then around the world, we're finding all of the archives, copies of the archives. They're being digitized and reconciled 
for a virtual reconstruction. And I think that's a perfect, and the government is getting behind it because it's a gift actually to government. How are we going to do this? But I think that's a perfect example of what you're talking about, that there was, the, the archives were destroyed in a political act and then our gift, what better gift for the future is then to create a new um, archive. And I do feel very, very strongly as one of the few library directors who come from a conservation background is that conservation and preservation is all about the future. It's actually not about the past. Thank you so much for your exposition. Thank you. More questions, reflections? Right the Up there, oh, no. step by step, okay. throw Small. it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, in, his, um, in his Atlas of New Librarianship, Professor David Langs offers a guide to practitioners, and he says that the new librarianship is no longer based on books and artifacts, but on knowledge and learning. And he suggests that the new mission for libraries is to improve society through facilitating knowledge creation in their local communities. Do you agree or disagree with this? And if you agree, how far do you think libraries are? Um, so I, I think what, what I've tried to say is that I, I don't disagree that um, providing access to knowledge is of absolutely fundamental uh, importance. And certainly supporting the creation of knowledge, providing platforms to do that. And many of us are engaged in that activity very actively. are just hearing Paul Aris's talk about the uh, UCL Press, for example. Many of us are, have, have been doing that kind of thing uh, for a, uh, a long time. But I think fundamentally, um, having preservation at the heart of what we do, as I tried to show over the last half an hour, has fundamental implications for society. We need those kind of reference points for information that is required for healthy lives of citizens, for them to be able to be sure that they can continue to l live in a country or have access to certain fundamental rights or that governments can operate properly or that electors can have information that help them make democratic decisions um, that are well informed. So I don't think these are either or um, issues. I think we have to find a way to bring preservation back into the heart of our organizations as a service and not see it just as something which, you know, when I entered the profession that had quite a, a sort of, uh, 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 there were kind of negative connotations around it, if I can put it like that. So some of my bosses, library directors were sort of steering me away from preservation. That's not what that kind of sort of thing you need to go into. Um, but I, I think we need to kind of redress and reframe what preservation is there for. And fundamentally, it's to help our society in the future. Because looking back and being able to have trusted access to information that is independently held and verified and guarded is something that we have to uh, be able to provide. Because there are so many attacks on that sense of what knowledge and truth is about. We have to be the guardians of that because, um, as I was also trying to show, that sense that, oh, well, we can just outsource that to, uh, to Google or to Flickr, um, you know, that is not a sustainable model at all. I think there are one more questions up there and then we have one here. No, in that case, the cube goes forward in a careful way. <laughs> uh, thank you, Richard, for a really relevant and very inspiring speech. Um, I come from a museum background, and I just wanted to add that um, the role that you describe and uh, indicate for libraries and archives is something that a museum also has a role to play in that, very definitely. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I think one of the things which is quite interesting at the moment is there has been a lot of um, archiving, and particularly if you look at the um, Documenting the Now project, um, archiving sort of uh, civil society groups who've been sort of protesting or campaigning against the alt-right groups in America and things like this. And I actually think that that's in really important to kind of archive the work that they're doing. So absolutely fundamentally important. But I think it's really important to be archiving what the alt-right groups are saying. Because we need to know what these, what, what the whole, you know, every spectrum of opinion on these issues is so that we can understand it and so that arguments can be placed on either side of the equation. I, I, I think that's something which kind of only recently sort of penetrated my thick brain um, and that we need to kind of be addressing as well. I wondered if there are any examples in the audience of uh, doing this kind of thing in your institutions. We have one here and then up there. Were you first? Okay, one, two, three, and then we have to close. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your speech. I'm currently the, the director of the KU Leuven Libraries, so I come from that background and those history. And I think it's quite important what you told us, because even in my university, we have to struggle to tell people that it is important to keep information and which information we should keep, which we shouldn't. That, so thank you very much for reminding us of um, what happened and what is still very important at this time. Thank you. Um, hi, Richard. Thank you again for a fantastic um, talk as well. Um, yesterday, we had a really good talk by Mary Robinson about climate change and how we should really become activists in that domain. I wonder what your thoughts are on us being the activists for digital preservation, not just for our own societies, but for the society across the globe. Because if we are struggling with this, if we are looking at how we can do this, the society goes far beyond us and they don't have any capacity to do this. So what, I'm just interested in your thoughts about that. I, I, think, that's, uh, I think that's a really important point, Masood. Um, I don't have any easy answers to that. I think there are ways in which it can be quite challenging in you know, looking back at um, our colonial past, particularly in Western European nations. Uh, we have acquired through fair means or foul um, you know, major archival collections and library collections and cultural treasures that originated in other parts of the world. And you could say that that's us taking, you know, some preservation burden away from those countries, but is it legitimate for us to hang on to those? What can, role can digitization play in giving access back openly and freely to those uh, countries? I think there's some very interesting debates going on in the kind of post-colonial communities around um, the archives of countries that have recently become independent, where there have been not only destruction of colonial era records of those uh, countries, but also those archives have come back to the former colonial powers. Uh, are we depriving those countries of their history in the same way that the Ba'ath Party archives are now, if you like, in an in the, in the custody of an imperial power. Um, and so there are very complex and difficult ethical questions around this. And then uh, I think the point you're making is really an economic one, where um, many countries around the world do not have the capacity to deal with preservation. And um, I guess there are projects like the Endangered Archives Program, which is um, uh, the uh, Arcadia uh, foundation fund of the British Library administer, which are steps towards collective action to help um, that kind of uh, issue. Um, I think there could be m a greater role for international bodies like the UN or UNESCO in supporting some of this, um, and and indeed for national libraries around the world for to become more active as regional players. And I think that would go for. Uh, 
you know, major university research libraries too. But I think there's a, a huge set of problems I don't have any kind of easy answers to it. But thank you for raising it, Masood. A very, very short last reflection or question. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. I'm Kristina Hormia-Poutanen from the National Library of Finland. So you asked for examples, and uh, I'd like to tell what, what's happening in Finland. So we, we have uh, what we call National Digital Library. So it's a network of uh, archives, museums, and libraries. And uh, during the past five, five years or so, uh, we have developed two services, one of them being a digital preservation service for the whole uh, cultural heritage network in, in Finland. Um, so this is one example for you, but it might be a good idea to compare a bit sort of different kind of examples. But this is a national level solution, but in some other countries we have some other examples and really to, to collect best, best practices and then, then sort of uh, share, share knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you very much, Richard.